Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a recent read for Four Books Read. Bessarabian Nights by Stella Brinzianu, a novel from Moldova, although she uh, since the age of 18 has lived in the UK and this is written in English originally, not in Moldovan. Uh, book of a long-listed case study by Scots writer Graham McRae Burnett. Anthony Mara's third novel, Mercury Pictures Presents, just released, and a novel from the 1960s, Genoa, A Telling of Wonders by Paul Metcalf. So I'm going to start with the Moldovan novel. I first saw this on Bob the Booker's channel. It's one of those books I imagined would give me uh, some insight and information on a country I knew uh, next to nothing about, which is Moldova. Uh, reputedly the poorest country uh, in Europe and uh, one that had stuck in my mind because of uh, Naomi Alderman's uh, novel The Power which is essentially uh, a war of women against men uh, it's described as feminist uh, sci-fi um, and it centered one of the uh, the centers of conflict in Moldova because Moldova is one of the centers of the um, sex trafficking industry and indeed that features in here so that was one of the reasons that I was I was keen to read this um, and it, it gives me what I want but it's a bit pedestrian so what I wanted was an insight into the traditions and the culture and the superstitions and the history of Moldova for example Moldova was originally called Bessarabia which I didn't know I mean I'd heard the name Bessarabia but I never would have associated it with, Mold with Moldova um, so it gave me all of that um, and as I say there, there's uh, also the the, the, the uh, sex uh, trafficking storyline which which is something I, I wanted to find out about it's basically three um, uh, young women uh, in, who are blood sisters they literally uh, cut a blood oath to each other in their wrists and then they get it slightly wrong and they don't they don't um, follow the traditions and one of their mothers sort of says oh that's a bad omen um, and one of them ends up being trafficked in Italy one of them ends up uh, relocating to London because obviously being so poor a lot of Moldovans go and try and make their living abroad and the third stays at home and it's essentially through the eyes of the one who's in captivity uh, in a brothel and the one in London uh, who decides she's going to try and track her down and, and, and sort of goes all in search of her in Italy with support from the, the one who stayed at home. And I have to say, uh, it's a pity for me that the one who stayed at home, who's called Doina, uh, wasn't given equal treatment because in a way she was the most interesting character uh, of the three. Um, but anyway... And that, that's pretty much it, really. Uh, as I say, it's quite pedestrian. Um, the language isn't, you know, is, isn't fantastic. The storyline is kind of unfurls along routes you'd probably anticipate. But, you know, it did what I wanted it to do. And in that respect, just going back to the Naomi Alderman uh, treatment of Moldova, I found her treatment of it absolutely risible. Um, and what the beauty of this is, because this is written by by someone who knows what she's talking about, unlike Naomi Alderman, who I didn't think knew anything about Mold Moldova. Um, you know, this talks about sex trafficking uh, with a legitimacy and authority that Naomi Alderman just just couldn't reproduce. So, you know, props to this over the. I mean, I hated Naomi Alderman's The Power. It's just two star reads for me. Um, and this this sort of uh, gives me uh, ammunition as as to why I, you know, what I felt originally was correct that 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 the whole Moldovan premise just didn't hold in the power, and and this goes some way to sort of showing why. But three stars. On to case study. As I say, this has been long listed for um, the Booker International, and probably be the last of the books I read on on the list. I'd already read four and I'd already bought this before the list was announced. Um, so I would have read five off the list. What was it 13 or 16, whatever it is. And I don't really intend to read any of the others. I didn't know what to make of this to the extent I'm not even sure I can rate this, uh, you know, give it a rating in, in stars because I'm torn. I'm not sure if this is sort of the Emperor's New Clothes and it's really hollow and lacks in anything or whether there's so much alluded to off the page from real life 
that I just, because I'm not versed in it, that I missed all of the stuff. And I just don't know the answer to that. I think it's, um, I mean, R.D. Lang, the, 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 the psychologist, psychiatrist, is, is overtly name-checked here. And I think in a way, this book is a dialogue with the ideas of R.D. Lang. And I read his book, The Divided Self, many, many years ago and can't really remember it in, in that detail. But as it's sort of represented here, it seems to be that, you know, there's no single core of a person's identity, how they project themselves. They're made up of all sorts of different cores and, and they all bear equal weight, that none of them are any more sort of fundamental or legitimate than any of the others. And that's why it was called The Divided Self. My interest in Lang was more about his views about schizophrenia, which are not dealt with directly, although this book does mention sort of schizoid in this notion of the divided self. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go down that route uh, of, 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 you know, what I find fascinating about Lang because it's not really relevant to this book. So this is set in the 1950s in the UK as it's emerging out of rationing and wartime austerity. And a young woman whose sister has committed suicide, she wants to look into that suicide because she believes the last thing she did before she committed suicide was having one of her regular therapy sessions and she believes in some way that the therapist has persuaded her to jump off the bridge and kill herself so she's going to go and submit herself to the same therapist but because they're sisters she has to filter herself because she knows that if she talks about certain childhood experiences that they were shared by her sister and that might tip the wink to the uh, therapist that, that, you know, they were related and, and this, this isn't as it seemed. So already you get this notion of, um, you know, choosing different cells. She calls herself a different name. But all the characters here, to some extent, are divided cells. And the book starts with uh, a preface where the author of the book, perhaps Graham McRae Burnett, perhaps a, fiction, perhaps a fictional author, is contacted by someone saying, I have this box of um, journals uh, from the woman who turns out to be the, the, the sister who's going in search of, of the therapist. Um, you know, would you be interested in them for a piece of writing? So already we've got books within books within books. We've got the author who wrote this book or the fictional author who wrote this book. We've got the journals of the woman. We've got uh, autobiography and it's called case study. We've got autobiography and case studies from the therapist. All of these are produced in the book. And it's interesting that um, trust, which is also on the book along list, is also books within books within books. So there seems to be a bit of a theme in, in um, on the book list this year. But anyway, um, I feel trust does it much more convincingly here because as I say I couldn't get I couldn't find a core to this book to hang on to whereas with trust it was clear what that core was so the other thing is I read a book called The Book of Portraiture by American author Steve Thomas Sula which is a book in five sections which are thematically related in, in terms of uh, portraiture of, of human beings but they're across they take place across history and one of them was an early uh, an early, you know, around the time of Freud or just after sort of Freud was still practicing in Austria, uh, a case of a hysterical woman going to see a therapist. And she too is sort of accused by the therapist of adopting a persona in therapy that is not her real self. But that story works because it has a hilarious payoff. This is very similar. This is someone going into therapy under false pretenses in that she's not presenting her true self or she doesn't think she is, but doesn't really have a payoff. I mean, there is a plot conclusion. Um, but, yeah, I just, I couldn't get to grips. I couldn't find any handholds in this as to how I should be taking it or how I could be taking it. Taking it. Uh, the therapist is a loathsome man. He's not even a qualified therapist. He's got no medical training. He's uh, very much a maverick. But because he sort of lucks out by meeting Dirk Bogard at a party and saying some things that Bogard found very profound as he was struggling with his own uh, repressed homosexuality or at least hidden homosexuality, Bogard starts talking to all his show, showbiz mates and they all start coming to seek this guy. So he sets himself up as a therapist. Um, but he's not really a therapist. And yet the therapy sessions of the young woman and him look like therapy sessions. So that that sort of 
contradiction didn't quite work for me. He's a bogus therapist, but actually he seems to be giving quite standard therapy uh, reactions. So, yeah, I, I'm afraid I just didn't get to grips with this book at all. It's well written. It sort of cracks along at a fair pace. But I, as I say, I couldn't find any handholds on how I was supposed to take this book. You know, there is a lot about sort of R.D. Lang, but it's not but it's not written. It's written by someone who sets himself up as an absolute opponent of R.D. Lang, even though their ideas are very similar because of personal beef and the fact that the therapist here is a young man wrote to, you know, he worked alongside Lang. But when they went their separate ways and Lang took off and he was just starting to make his own career and name, he wrote to Lang and Lang just ignored his letter. So now this guy has the hunt with Lang and sort of attacks him at every corner even though their theories, such as he has a theory, are very similar. So again, I I just didn't know how to take it. So I can't even give it a rating, I'm afraid. I'm not saying it's a good book. I'm not saying it's a bad book. I don't know. And on to Mercury Pictures Presents by Anthony Mara. So Anthony Mara has written two novels previously, which are fantastic. Both One was set in Chechenia and one was set sort of across Russia uh, under Stalin and are superb. Here he turns his attention to Hollywood and uh, fascist Italy during the Second World War. And I, uh, the Hollywood sections are great. The fascist Italy ones are much more humdrum. So I think this book is a much less of a success than the other two. And actually it turned out to be quite disappointing. It was a buddy read with Zena over at uh, Beating Around the Books. And she pointed out to me that uh, Mara's talked about this book emerging out of two different book ideas that he had, which he fused into one, which is never a good idea because it, it betrays that, it reveals that. It's a certain lack of decisiveness, there's a certain lack of um, discipline uh, because you're trying to accommodate two things into one narrative and they don't, you know, it 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 shouldn't be done really. So it starts off with a superlative scene between uh, Art Feldman, who is one of the co-owners of a, a Hollywood studio that flourished during the silent movie era and has had to come into the modern talking era, kicking and screaming, and is struggling accordingly. And it's under financial pressure. And he has a, a girl Friday who is much more than that. I mean, she sort of runs his life for him and she has desires to be a, 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 produ a film producer in her own right. And when this is set in the uh, late 30s, early 40s, having a woman in even in that position is sort of virtually unknown. And they have this fizzing, crackling banter. Um, and it turns out that uh, Art has been uh, summoned or subpoenaed to appear before a Senate hearing committee about uh, propaganda in Hollywood, uh, you know, movies, uh, but are actually serving as propaganda as Roosevelt wants to get America into the war. And of course, a huge tranche of the American population were isolationists and didn't want to get involved. So the Senate were investigating whether Hollywood was complicit with Roosevelt or even acting under his bidding to try and nudge America into the war. And that's a brilliant set. You know, that's scene one. And then we go into um, the Maria, that his, his PA, her family history of um, how she and her mother got out of fascist Italy but uh, her father didn't her father was a political prisoner um, but the problem with all of that is it's already happened because she's in America in this film studio we don't need to know that background it's and it goes on for so long this book takes so long to get going because what we want to know is what happens at the Senate committee and, you know, she's she's saying to him, do you want me to write the speech? And he goes, no, no, I've got it under control. She goes, well, do you want me to have a look at it? Show me what you got. He says, no, I've, I've not started yet, but I know what I'm going to say. So it's set up with this sort of great point of tension as a jumping off point and then ignores it for 100 plus pages. That structurally does not work. I didn't find the bits about fascist Italy terribly illuminating or interesting or novel. I'd read a Italo Calvino's book, Into the War, this year, which does it for me. You know, this adds nothing. And when we finally do get to the Senate hearing committee, it lasts about a page. I mean, it's a brilliant scene and it's very funny and it's very clever. But you feel cheated because you've been waiting 100 pages and you get one page. And then the book 
still talking about the, the sort of recent Italian history of Maria and other characters that come into her orbit. It stops being about propaganda, even though Art Feldman's um, studio are commissioned by the military to produce propaganda films. And one of the characters, who's also an emigre from Italy, is charged with pouring through the propaganda films of Germany, Italy and Japan uh, and analysing them and, and writing down scene by scene by scene to hand over, uh, to give them ideas of how to, to counter that and stuff. So it's still in there, but it's, you know, that sort of focal, crystal focal, crystallised focus of the Senate committee. It's not about that anymore. And there are a few points about propaganda, and I'll come back to those with a couple of readings. Um, but it's really about all these characters who have washed up in Hollywood as emigres, German, Italian. Um, there's a Chinese, you know, Chinese-American who gets mistaken for being Japanese and, and has a lot of trouble for that. And we get each of their individual stories of, you know, what it's like to be uh, an immigrant and, and and basically an alien. You know, the, the, the German and Italian characters are under legislative prescription. You know, they can't go more than a few miles from where they're based and, and they have to surrender all their cameras and, and all of this stuff. But it, each one has left behind something or left somebody behind. And they're, free, you know, they're racked with guilt. And I just thought that was really clumsily set up by Mara. So Maria's got, you know, a guilt thing that basically she's responsible for her father ending up being caught by the fascists. It was heavy handed. I never really believed it. Um, this guy who's looking through the propaganda, he's got a guilt thing uh, back in Italy that he's left behind a, a great secret. One of the most interesting characters who's called Anna, who's a, um, she was an architect in Nazi in Germany but when the Nazis came to power she was given a choice work you know build buildings for the Nazis or or you know your career is ended and she refused even though her husband was a you know gleefully joined the Nazis she refused and her and exactly what happened is her career you know bottomed and tanked so she goes over to America where she's building miniature sets in this Hollywood studio she too has a great you know, secret that she's left behind. It's just too much. Every There are too many characters with too many, you know, subplots about what they've left behind and their guilt that I just wasn't engaged with. The best bit of writing, and bear in mind, one of the things about Mara that I love from his first two books is his writing. And there's not that much writing up to that level here, except there's one point where two extras from the studio, from the studio who've always played you know, scenes where they, they get killed off. You know, they're, they're, they're the guys in the background who get shot or whatever. So they've died a thousand times. They gleefully enlist, which I didn't actually buy, but anyway. And they're the only two two uh, members of the studio on its sort of board of remembrance who die. So they get to die for real. Uh, everyone else, you know, the others who either got um, conscripted or enlisted, are wounded and pranged and all that sort of stuff. But these are the only two who die. And that was poignantly and beautifully written. That, but that's the only scene in which I felt genuinely moved here, which, again, I found disappointing given his track record. Um, so I'm just going to read two little bits because I feel there was a, actually another novel in here that, that could have been developed in a much more interesting way and, and wasn't really. Um, so... Artie is watching a propaganda film or an anti-Japanese propaganda film that his studio have been commissioned to, to make. He's watching the, <clears throat> the first uh, uh, raw cut of it. As he watched, Artie felt called by contradiction. Conspiracy was one of Hollywood's most reliable plot engines, but by encouraging audiences to accept the plausibility of conspiracies in peacetime, had Artie primed audiences to see enemies everywhere in war. Weren't these stab-in-the-back fantasies as perverse as any found in German propaganda reels? And weren't fears of fascism coming to America borne out by the concentration camps going up in the Californian desert, which was for Japanese interns? So the bit of that I just want you to hold on to is um, by encouraging audiences to accept the plausibility of conspiracies in peacetime. So just hold on to that. And then we come to Anna, who, as I say, was this sort of miniaturist uh, uh, scene designer. She's been conscripted by the uh, American army to build a, 
a one-to-one -one, uh, reconstruction of an area of Berlin because the, the military want to see what's the most efficient way to cause a firestorm. So they have the exact materials that the buildings are made of and she's charged with things like, you know, getting the curtains right and, and all this sort of stuff. If we are to burn, if we are to burn Berlin over there, we must learn to burn it over here. And to burn it, we must build it, which, Colonel McAllister says, is where you folks come in. Sonnenthal raises a hand. I'm sorry, Colonel, you want us to build Berlin in Utah. Not all of it, naturally. A representative neighbourhood. Blah, 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 blah. The firebombing campaign will target neighbourhoods like Kreuzberg, Wedding and Yukon, communist strongholds during the Weimar years, where even today you might not find a dozen Nazi party members amongst its tenement blocks. Were there any justice, the air raids would target Wannese or Grunwald, but the Nazi brass live in villas too sparsely distributed to warrant area bombing runs. Densely populated urban centres where multi-storey tenement blocks predominate offer the highest return on investment, but even these rental barracks prove vexingly fire resistant. It is these tenements crowding Red Berlin that the assembled emigres are to construct in the Utah desert. No expense spared. A molecularly faithful recreation down to the nightstand bibles and the carpet piles and the bassinets. So what I found interesting about that is that, apart from the fact it's a deliberate targeting of civilians, but after all, the Luftwaffe did that in London. So, you know, equal hypocrisy. But they're targeting communist areas, Marxist areas of Berlin. And when you go back to that earlier bit I read about sort of peacetime conspiracies, because what, what comes out of the war in America is McCarthyism, targeting the Reds under the bed. And I think actually that would have been a much more interesting if that had been brought slightly more to the fore than all this other stuff, uh, which I didn't find interesting at all. It, it suggested to me that America and I don't know how true this is. Brian, this is one for you. Uh, you know, the America's already looking forward to uh, facing off against against Stalin, uh, even as the war was progressing. And I don't just mean in 1945, when Churchill sort of coined the term the Iron Curtain. Actually, he didn't coin it in 45, but you know what I mean. Um, that as early as, you know, straight after Pearl Harbor, for, and then 42, 43, the Americans were already eyeing that there would be this great face-off with Stalin and, and, and communist Russia. And then, of course, we get the whole uh, McCarthyism. So, to me, it was a shame it didn't really do that, apart from those two, two disparate, disparate bits. Anyway, very disappointing. Uh, three stars. And finally, in terms of what I finished this week, so this is Genoa by Paul Metcalf. Now, I was recommended Paul Metcalf by one of my uh, viewers, uh, Mitchell Axler, who lives over in Florida. And he described this as David Markson before there was David Markson. This is written in 1960. And what he's referring to is the fact that Markson's really radical, uh, innovative writing didn't really start happening until the 1990s. So this preceded it by 25 years. And he's absolutely right. I mean, I love this. Five stars. So Paul Metcalf himself is uh, Herman Ver one of Herman Melville's great grandsons. So, uh, and that that does sort of inform this book. It's simply about uh, a family father who lives in Indiana in a fairly remote um, old building that his grandfather had built on the on the prairie. Um, his wife is out on her shift w at work. He's at home with the kids, looking after them. So he cooks them dinner. And then he sort of parts them in front of the TV to, to be the babysitter while he goes upstairs into the attic where his books are. And he's just contemplating. And what he's contemplating is, uh, again, there is motion, this time with awe and terror. For whatever my condition, the condition of thought and flesh, the reality in which I am formed and deformed, in which I am known to myself and to others, all is become mutable. He's considering his own thoughts and his own body, his own flesh. And the way he does that is he's referring to uh, the, the writings of, Herb, of Herman Melville, his novels and his letters, the journals of Christopher Columbus and a medical textbook because he once, this character once studied medicine. And he's constantly trying to 
understand himself through these texts and in a way he himself is a text he's not i mean you know he's a character in a fictional novel so he is a text he's not a real person but he's written as if obviously he is a real person so and Tai P, Melville's first book, was first rejected because, quote, it was impossible that it could be true and therefore was without real value. So there you've got a novel rejected because it didn't sound authentic and, and true enough to real life, even though it absolutely couldn't be about real life because it's a novel. It's constructed in words. And that's what this character himself is doing about his own thoughts and his own body. You know, he's hearing the wind blowing. He's hearing his kids screaming downstairs and then he hits a state where he can't hear them anymore. Not because they've shut up, but because he's moved into a different state of consciousness. And all the time, this the, these three works are feeding in into him trying to root and understand what his being is. I don't mean his identity, his actual existential, essential being. And the medical textbook is, is there because... Why has this character chosen Melville? Well, we know that Metcalfe himself is related to Melville. You know, is that a genetic legacy? Well, it can't be. It's a, it's a, it's a construct of the mind. It must be, um, you know, a, a conscious drive on his part. And yet the medical textbook, because it's dealing with the whole thing about sort of conception and the development of the embryo, it, it reintroduces the genetic component uh, of it, that, that maybe it is somehow... This whole being and identity is somehow genetically transferred. It's brilliant. It's an absolutely brilliant structure. The reason, in case you're not familiar with David Marx, and I say that it, it prefigured Marx, is it's this, you know, very, very um, developed use of texts. You know, it doesn't hide text and bury text like you get in sort of intertextuality where it may not... Um, uh, uh, cite who it's from it's like up to the the reader to find that out to work it out here you know it's clearly you know this is from Columbus this is from Melville this is from the medical text but this is from one or two other texts so it doesn't hide them at all and it's the way they are plucked to back up what his where his thoughts are at that moment all the associations from one to the other it's the way they're arranged it's the way they spark off each other that Columbus speaks across the, the, the centuries to Melville and then Melville speaks across the centuries to this guy. You know, Indiana, I think, is landlocked uh, and it's on the prairie and he describes the, uh, the prairie as being like an ocean. You know, there's nothing out there. And then the wind that blows through the timbers is like the, you know, the gales at sea. And he has a big central beam running across his... Um, running across his his roof under the attic just as ships have the running across the you know the bottom of the ship to hold it all together so i just think this is brilliantly done and i'm really keen to read some more stuff by him so five stars and thank you to mitchell axler for pointing me to him as to what i'm currently reading uh, i'm reading axion's end by lindsay ellis from sci-fi again i saw this on bob the booker's channel and I will be reading the last of my Women in Translation uh, books, which is Tomb of Sand by Indian writer uh, Jeetan Jali Shri, translated by Daisy Rockwell. I hope to start that this coming week. So there you have it, Booktube. Uh, a mixed reading bag, I'd say. Quite a lot of disappointments. I mean, that was fine. So, did what I asked of it. This, I just don't know what to make of. Incredibly disappointing and wonderful. So... You know, that was my reading week. So till next time, thanks very much.